Hey, everybody, my name's Rob Husted, and thank you for taking the time to dive more into IBA bartending, International Bartending Association bartending competitions and how to score better. Uh, the first time I went to my first IBA comp was uh, overseas, and uh, I didn't know what I was walking into. I've been to bartending competitions before here in the States. I've competed in speed comps, flare comps, mixology comps, accuracy comps, everything under the sun kind of comps. Uh, and done pretty well with them. But when I went to my first IBA comp, I was lost and I wasn't sure what was going on, let alone how how they were judging. Uh, thank God Julio Cabrera, Papa Doble himself was there, uh, was able to guide me a little bit and get me on my path to where we're at now as being one of the, uh, the coaches for Team USA with the uh, USBG, United States Bartenders Guild, and helping prep our bartenders to uh, compete better overall in these competitions. And uh, just from competing in, with, in them over the years and now training the classes, I've learned so much. And I want to share that knowledge with you today. So hopefully you too, at your next competition, can score better. Because once you know the rules and you understand how they judge, it makes it a little bit easier. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen real quick here. All right, and this is going to be a part one, so it'll be a part two later. Uh, stepping up your garnish game. If you notice, these are actual pictures from this past year's IBA World Cocktail Championship in Rome, Italy. Uh, the first look at it, uh, the drinks look amazing, and uh, the glassware, the garnishes, uh, and they all look a little different, but still same because they're grouped in different categories. Uh, but let's get into it. What makes a good garnish? Right, you throw a garnish on a cocktail. We've all done the, the lime squeeze on there for the Roman Coke, which now makes it a Cuba Libre. And, you know, the mint for the fresh mojito or the mint julep, celery and, and olives and bacon and cheeseburgers for Bloody Marys and things like that. But wh what makes a good garnish? Uh, to me, the garnish kind of helps bring you into the cocktail right away. Well, from when I first look at a cocktail and I see the garnish and I see the presentation, it should tell me a story about the cocktail. Something of, I know something about the cocktail, like, all right, cool. There's some beautiful mint in there. So there's probably mint in the cocktail or looking at it. It tells me a story. Maybe there's uh, uh, a decoration where the pineapple looks like a bird almost. And so it's more of a tropical thing. Uh, maybe there's some decoration around the drink. We, you know, it's placed on like uh, maybe some, um, uh, brown sugar to, so it makes it look like a beach so it's a tiki tropical cocktail there's so much but a garnish should tell the story of the cocktail by looking into it but more importantly when i bring it up it should give me some aroma and so many people tend to overlook the importance of a garnish in these iba cocktail competitions where garnish is king let's take a look at some cocktails But, I mean, they all look like spectacular cocktails, right? Just by looking at them, I'm enticed because they they're, they're look incredible cocktails. The garnish took a lot of time and prep, and it's it stood out. It was something different. The cocktails could taste horrible, but just by looking at them, they look professional and looks like something I would love to try. They they bring me in. Uh, garnishes and more. Garnishes are so underutilized in uh, American competitions, in cocktail competitions, flare comps, everything else. Up until maybe the last two or three years, now garnishes have really been a focus on a lot of cocktail competitions. And, and big thanks to the IBA because it is so important there that that's finally getting translated here in the States. Uh, just for the garnishes alone in IBA cocktail competitions, you have a 15 minute prep time where you're sitting there just for 15 minutes in front of a judge, in front of everyone else, creating that garnish. And then once you create that garnish, you put in your tray right before you go up on stage to compete. So it's, it's really something impressive, let alone just to do, let alone you're being judged on that time while you're doing it as well. Uh, a, an important thing about general rule for IBA competitions is garnishes do not count towards your overall in ingredient list as long as they are not touching the liquid. So if I have a, a beautiful decoration and garnish on my top of my cocktail, but it's not touching the liquid and it's visually appealing, it's, it doesn't count towards a, a maximum number of ingredients. And usually maximum number of ingredients can be anywhere from five to seven ingredients for a cocktail, depending on what kind of competition. But if it's like a touching the the uh the liquid or if i do an orange expression and the orange 
oils and essence go into the drink, well, now that counts as an ingredient. Uh, an exception to that would be, let's say I'm using uh, fresh lemon juice in my cocktail, right? And I squeeze some more lemon essence on there or have a lemon garnish touching that. Uh, as long as I'm utilizing an ingredient that's already pre-existing in there, uh, just utilizing it multiple times, it does not count towards uh, an actual ingredient other than one time. Like I can't be dinged for lemon juice, fresh lemon juice, uh, a lemon peel and a uh, lemon pith, if you will, as three ingredients when it's just a lemon. So keep that in mind when you're, you're building your cocktails. Um, presentation vessels are so underutilized. Uh, not only when you present the cocktail, you have a great cocktail, you have a great garnish on there, but there's uh, like a thing called decoration and presentation where you can like put it on a platform or put all four on a, on a, on a tray with some decoration that helps further tell that story. And you get points for that. And that's something you can actually prep ahead of time. So don't underthink that and try to think, will it help tell the story? And maybe sometimes you don't want to do that. Like you're, you don't have enough time to do that, or you only have so much room on your bar top to complete all this. This is all things you got to look into. Um, and then one thing, another big thing besides the garnish was very eye-opening is generally at IBA cocktail competitions, you they give you the microphone for one minute where you get to talk about your cocktail and your inspiration for it. Most people just do that, you know, thinking, oh, cool, I'm going to talk about my cocktail, get the judges in the crowd behind me. All right. But you're also being judged on that as well, which we're going to break you, break into more a little bit after that. Um for your garnish prep, this is actually the score sheet that the judges use. It's more on deductions, this one, than more on what you would gain points on. Uh, you can get up to a 10-point deduction on use of unapproved material products. Uh, say you're, you're using a non-sponsor product or using something you, you should be using, like decorations for your garnish and things like that. Uh, products not in accordance with recipe, make sure you are completely transparent with every little thing you put on there and, and your garnish, you know, make sure you have everything in there because if you put other stuff in there that's, that's not quite in there, you're going to start to get dinged for that. Uh, Pre-carved or molded parts, like stuff that's already pre-done before you get there, uh, everything needs to be done during that 15 minute garnish time. If you bring stuff that's already done ahead of time, uh, you're going to get dinged for it. Sometimes the only exception that would be is uh, if you're using fresh juices. Um, I've seen it done both ways. I've seen the fresh juices done during your garnish time. I've seen your fresh juices done uh, as a designated time right before, right after your garnish time. Or I've seen them not even give a crap and let you do juicing whenever you want, as long as you bring it fresh. Uh, so just keep in mind, those are generally how it's done, but the rules do vary depending on competition to competition. Um, and then this is another big one. Competitor requires additional ingredients to be brought to them. Uh, what you happen what you normally do is you're doing stuff like, oh, hey, I, uh, can you get me a citrus peel or can you get me gloves? I forgot them. If you don't bring everything over once the time starts and you ask uh, someone from your team to help bring you over everything or anything, you will get dinged for that. So keep that in mind. You want to look like a professional. You're in charge of your domain and you have everything you need, uh, mise en place, to knock out that incredible garnish in 15 minutes. Um, uh, another thing, especially most of these competitions, IBAs competitions are overseas. Uh, just because I get a green pepper here in the United States, that green pepper in Rome is going to look completely different. Uh, keep, try to research, go on Google. Uh, if you have friends in those areas, wherever the competition is, have them send you pictures of what the local produce looks like. So many times we've gone to these competitions and our team is, is thrown for a loop that a, they might not even have those ingredients overseas are available for them. And you might try to bring them into you know, with your luggage and they might get confiscated through customs that you got to play factors in here. So just always have plans, be flexible and realize that this plan A might not work, but I have a solid plan B and plan C as well. Uh, this is generally what your setup's going to look like as you're practice. You've been practicing for months. You feel solid. You've got a great recipe. You know your spiel. You're ready to go. You're generally going to have two trays before you start. Uh, the bottom tray, your first tray there, you're going to see is your main tray. That's where it's going to have all your glassware on there, your uh, ingredients, your spirits, your mixes for your cocktails, pretty much everything on there except your garnishes. That second tray is going to be ideally your garnish tray, where when you do your garnish time for your 15-minute prep, you're going to bring just your garnish tray up with you. Knock out that stuff, knock out your garnishes, and we're getting to more of that in a second. And then when you're done, you're going to take that uh, vessel that you have your garnishes in, preferably a Ross glass or another vessel or something, and put that on your main tray. So now in your main tray, you have all your ingredients for your cocktail, uh, including your garnish, except for ice. When you do this, this is what it basically looks like for a general IBA competition. Those six-foot tables below is actually the competitor's getting ready to go on stage, 
prepping their garnishes during their 15 minute garnish time while competitors behind them have already done their garnishes and are actually competing. So it's a lot going on at once. Um, very rarely have I seen it where it's been secluded, where you kind of do it yourself and come up. It's more interactive this way. And I kind of like it this way because it kind of, it, it adds a little bit of showmanship to the, to the garnish prep time. And we get to see what's going on and see like, Oh my God, it's a cool technique. Did you see what they did over there and learn from different countries of how they do different things. Um, and if you look at the tables, the tables are six foot tables generally. Uh, and you're expected to share that with their competitor next to you. So you're really roughly going to have about three feet of space. So keep that in mind. If you're practicing at home, practice on about three feet uh, on a six foot table. So it's, I think three by two or whatever that is three by three, whatever that is. Uh, space wise, uh, and just really start utilizing as that space and not m having more than that space. You got to keep everything in there because you can't like really knock on your, your competitor side of stuff and doing stuff. And you only have so much room there. Um, and it gets a little nerve wracking. You're going to have people there filming you, taking pictures. Uh, it's your first time and you get a little nervous, just be prepared for it. It's, but just kind of like when you're at the bar, just treat those, you know, everyone at, the, at there watching like they're either guests at your bar. Just do what you do like you do normally. Uh, don't try not to let the shakes get in. I highly recommend not drinking any energy drinks before you're around on these competitions. I've, I've, I don't drink coffee. Uh, I, I don't drink espresso, but I do love energy drinks. And I've done it so many times where I've powered up on energy drinks, like, woo, ready to go. And then my hands are shaking uh, from the caffeine and the nerves sometimes from getting ready to, to cut that garnish and do things. And you don't want to take a chance and cut yourself. So hold off on the energy drinks until after you're around. Um, if you notice, this is uh, this is what one of our competitors from last year, Mariano Gill, Team USA, killing it. Brownsville, Texas, knocking out his garnish. Um, and a big important thing is gloves, those latex gloves, uh, whether they're black, clear, blue, it doesn't matter. Try to wear those. It's going to help you with sanitary things and score better. And uh, that's why you don't have to worry about wiping your hands every time and cleaning things. And if you notice, he's actually has a little mold there in his left hand, like cookie cutter molds and things and using that as shapes to pound out and, and create a design out of a heart, uh, from different fruits. And then the guy on the left with the clipboard is usually one of the judges watching you uh, do all this and going on and deducting everybody. Uh, generally, they have one to two judges uh, for X amount of competitors, for six competitors. I've seen one. I've seen two. Um, it all depends on their, the amount of staff that they have. But someone's always watching. So just always prepare when you're practicing that what you're doing, someone's always watching you. Whether they might be glancing somewhere else, might not be. You might get lucky if you mess up and do something. They don't see it. I mean, we're all human. Things happen, but always practice where someone's watching you. And if, it, if you screw up, you uh, assume you're just going to get deducted for it. This was the end, I think, of Mariano's garnish. Uh, one of her maybe two different options he was going with. And uh, this garnish here, this was the garnish that uh, I used that I got uh, last year at the IBA Pan American Games, where I was awarded uh, best overall cocktail. So what I'm going to do now is... Uh, don't can't be in front of you uh, physically to show you and go through a, a round for 15 minutes to do a whole garnish time from start to finish. So you see what you're walking into. So we're uh, we're going to do it virtually. We're going to watch this right here. Boom. 15 minutes starts. What I do is uh, on my watch, I tend to wear a watch when I generally never when I bartend. But when I'm doing garnish prep, I start the stopwatch. And this way, if I need to know how much time I have left, I just get a quick little glance and I can see what that is. Uh, some competitors I've seen have their iPhone up there. Some competitors do nothing. I've heard rumors uh, at some times at some of these IBA comps that if you're using a timing mechanism, uh, it doesn't look good for you. You may get deducted for it. I've heard that it doesn't matter. So again, every competition is different. Feel free to ask questions or ask for forgiveness, depending on your strategy. Um, generally, at IBA competitions, you're going to be making four identical cocktails. So a good rule of thumb is if I'm making four cocktails, I'm going to make five garnishes because I always want to have one extra in case something happens, one falls, I, you know, I, I have an extra one ready to go. So if you notice, I'm making five garnishes, but I have six lemons there. Uh, again, since I'm making five garnishes now, I'm going to have that extra one during this time because if I screw up, I can't go back. I can't get up and grab some more lemons without getting deducted. So if you notice uh, that second peel that I did, uh, it was a little short. It wasn't as long as the other one. So I kind of put that to the side um, as a strategy that I don't plan on using it. But if I screw up again, I'm going to have to use it. Uh, that peel right there, it kind of peeled a little quick and got cut before it went all the way down. So I tossed it and started again. That's why it's always good to have extra garnishes, extra of everything you need. And those four ones look pretty identical there. Knocking out the fifth right about now. Uh, and then that little thing at the very top right, uh, that's a little like a dump bucket. 
Uh, I've, if you don't bring one, uh, you can always use the ice bucket from the hotels, which generally all of us do because most of us tend to forget to bring those, but uh, just have something where you put your trash in and it looks professional and clean, but something small where it doesn't take up too much space, um, a little bit of space that you have already. Uh, those scissors are pretty nice. Uh, I get those at Michael's or a craft store. They uh, just scissors that have different patterns in there. They give a nice little edge to uh, my lemon swath there and adds a little bit of a uh, little bit of flair to the garnish, if you will. But it's something easy to do, consistent, nice, clean edges, but artistically done. And then right away, I take those peels and throw them in the trash. Don't need them anymore. Get that stuff out of your way and keep moving forward. And now I'm just kind of measuring, just make sure I got the right size for the next one so I know where to cut. And ideally, you want to be uh, consistent with your garnishes as possible, making sure that uh, all your garnishes look as consistently the same as everyone, just like your drinks would be consistent, just like you would have the same level, ideally, on every cocktail, which we'll get into part two to make sure your levels are identical. Uh, if not, you'll get dinged on that as well. <clears throat> And um, this garnish prep time for this 15 minutes, ideally, you want to practice this, you know, numerous times. I think I practiced mine for the IBA one at least 10 times, not as much as I would normally have done it. Uh, I, I didn't get as much time to practice as I normally do because I have a busy life, unfortunately. But I practiced 10 times, and especially the day of that morning, I went through at least, you know, four times just solid back to back to back to back and got it down to about 12 minutes. Um, I left myself a little bit of a leeway. So this way, in case anything happens, I screwed up, I had to make another garnish. I have a little bit of play where I'm still going to be under that 15 minutes. And even though I'm probably not going to use that last one, I'm still going to cut it just to use it in case something happens. I have a backup. I'm ready to go. Because again, all I have is that short 15 minutes. And you might think 15 minutes is a long time, but when you're up there and you're knocking out your garnish, it goes by like that. Just trying to be as tidy as possible, clean as I go. Now, this is something fun. Uh, this is like a little metal circle. It's a little, little tip that you get from uh, when you make your own whipped creams. You put it in a little Ziploc bag and you do this. So what I like to use with this is just take the other end and just use it to punch it and, and make a circle. Uh, it's a great size for these lemon swabs. There's different molds you can use, but uh, this one's nice and sharp. It's just metal. And when I buy this pack, I usually get like six of them in one pack. So it's a, it's, it's a fun little tool I use. And then the problem is it kind of gets stuck in there like that. So I'm using my uh, sword pick to dig it out uh, from there to keep it going as well. I'm not tossing those little circles, gonna end up utilizing them as well. Uh, and the sword picks that I used for this one, and this was kind of nice, I found this overseas. Uh, it has, it adds, you know, just a, a normal wooden pick. Uh, it's got a little block in there, it adds color, and that little red ball, it was a nice little color pop of different things. There's different sword picks you can use. Um, these ones you'll generally see at IBA competitions uh, with this little swap on there, because it's kind of nice, because you can use it and let it, sit on the glass as well if you want to use it like that and have a hanging garnish opposed to just putting something across uh it all depends what your overall garnish and what your glassware and what you're going for uh but use that as strategy but try different things so what i'm doing now is punching out two identical holes in that lemon swab um, and this wasn't the first utilization of this this garnish i i didn't know where i was going from it i, I haven't seen this before i kind of just came up with it uh, through trial and error, I'm like, all right, cool, let me do this, uh, let me do this. And the reason why I used, um, started with lemons is because I had a lemon in my cocktail. It was, uh, I think the main sponsor was uh, tequila. So I want to use, with tequila, I'm like, all right, let's let's do some lemon. And then I also want to use some cinnamon. So I made a, uh, use one of the cinnamon syrups there. And I think I did a passion fruit foam with some other stuff in there. But I wanted the garnish to tell the story of what was in the cocktail looking in, you know, enticing as well. So you'll see some lemon in here with the garnish. You'll see some cinnamon. And again, just being consistent, staying on time. Practice, practice, practice. So when you get up there, you don't think about it. You just muscle memory and go. 
and you'll be less nervous too. Look at that, we're already just about halfway through. And I swear that last five minutes just goes like by like that when you're up there. So right now, I generally just on my three foot station, just have what I need for my garnishes. Just that one tray of garnishes. Uh, my other tray, which my main tray is going to be with my all my spirits, my glassware, all my other ingredients is set off to the side that as soon as my round's done, uh, hopefully someone from my team, Team USA, will be able to take my garnish tray and bring me my main tray. So I'll still be sitting down, still be doing everything and knock that out. And you won't be dinged for that because uh, that'll be after your garnish time is done. Um, and it's just, obviously there's no room for all that to fit. You can try to do it. So I, I've seen some people do it, but uh, depending how much space you use and how big the table is. And I forget the exact percentage, but uh, of your garnish, uh, X amount has to be uh, edible. So it's not so much more of a all plastic or metal, but actual edible garnishes. Now I'm using a, a hole punch that I, I got at a local craft store. And it uh, punches out a little star uh, hole instead of just a normal circle hole, a little star hole. So I punch three little stars in there, which doesn't take up that much time, but adds just a little bit of detail. Um, to the cocktail and a little bit of a little bit of flair and artistic design. And it really doesn't take that much time up at all. Uh, honestly, when I'm doing it now, as I'm watching this, it uh, wasn't as straight across and consistent as I was in uh, the Pan American Games. Thank God, uh, this was only practice. But uh, normally, I would hopefully have a little bit of uh, better lines on those. And then in all transparency, I did this uh, last night, uh, no practice, just for the first time from watching an, an old video, me doing a, a practice video, trying to see how it went. So my time isn't going to be as good as it was when I was fully practiced. I can say that. And as we are approaching the five minute mark, my main part of my garnish is done. Now it's just time to uh, build on it. And that's uh, fresh lemongrass, uh, bringing back to that, that lemon element in the cocktail, but adding some color contrast and um, uh, girth, I guess, to the, to the garnish. but also keeping in line of telling the story of what's in that cocktail. Trying to be consistent where I get the same length out of each one, uh, about two, two strands each. Then on to the cinnamon sticks, which uh, normally that bag is full of cinnamon sticks. I took out the, the larger ones that wouldn't fit through the hole and left just the smaller ones uh, with, I think, one extra one. So this way, it's less thinking as I'm going. I have exactly in there what I need. And now I'm just kind of feeding that cinnamon stick through the same two holes that I fed the lemongrass through. And then from there, instead of moving on to the next one, doing the same thing, as I look at the time, I've got to keep going, um, utilizing that center hole with that pick and going straight through that. And this is how I left it before. And a couple of times I, I kept practicing, like, why is it falling apart? Why is it falling apart? And then I realized to utilize those leftover circles from the lemon peel and use that to push it in and hold it all together where it compacts it and compresses it, kept it nice and sturdy. And then from here, because I wanted to be all consistent and look clean, I'm cutting off the ends of the lemongrass. So the lemongrass lengths are the same length as the cinnamon sticks. Just looks a little bit more clean, a little bit more professional. 
And then in the cocktail like that is we, I served it in a rocks glass and it sat in there uh, and it was just a perfect fit leaned in there. And uh, it was, it was a great decoration for that cocktail. And I'm utilizing an extra one of my rocks glasses to put my garnishes in. So this way, while I'm on stage, I can grab and go and keep it simple. It's all ready to go, nice and compact. And it takes up very little uh, real estate on my bar when I'm competing because sometimes those bars, sometimes you have a lot of bar space on there and sometimes you have very little space. Uh, the same with the ice bucket. Uh, most of the time it's been little champagne buckets where it's hard to scoop and get the ice out of. And sometimes it's been bus tubs. Sometimes it's been a, a nice bucket. So uh, definitely bring different size scoops as well as it is a good tool for that from the small scoop to a big scoop. And if you have a scoop that you can actually drill holes into, so if you're scooping, there's not too much water comes out because sometimes they don't change the ice out in time. That's a good thing. We got that from Liz, uh, Team Puerto Rico, who lives in Miami now. She did that. And I thought that was a great idea. But also keep in mind, you know, we'll get into this more in part two, is if there's if your ice is watered down and there's a lot of water in your ice, ask for new ice before you on. You know, don't feel you don't have any say in what goes on. You want to be respectful as a competitor and, and not be a dick, but also... You could be respectfully respectful and ask for things to get done as well. Two minute warning coming down to the wire. Again, cutting the ends off, making sure they all look consistent, same length, nice, clean, straight lines. Color contrast between that red dot on the pick, the yellow, the green. The brown with the cinnamon smells nice, and it also, ingredients are all in the cocktail. Whew, about a minute left, two to go. I'm getting nervous. And this is where you just keep your head on. You keep moving forward. Move with purpose. You know what you're doing. You practice this. Just be confident. And if you have to go over time, you go over time. Uh, this last comp, one of our competitors from Team USA, went over on this time a lot. Uh, and for what they finished with their garnish, uh, Overall, we think they scored better by taking the time to finish their garnish than stopping early and not finishing their garnish because they were having problems because the fruit there was completely different and mushy what they were used to here in America. It's all about being thrown curveballs and how you react to them. But the more you practice while you're there with everything on site, the better prepared you'll be. 30 seconds. Coming down to the wire. Uh, and I'm not done. Now i got to clean my station. You want to make sure you start clean and you end clean. I'm utilizing that same bucket for trash, putting everything in there that I can. Uh, thank God my tools aren't too messy, so I don't have to worry about wiping everything down. It was all pretty clean. Keep it nice and organized together. Boom, clean that up. Boom, and time. Thumbs up with three seconds to spare. <laughs> and there's those beautiful garnishes. So there they are. Same garnish. Uh, it was a beautiful cocktail. The garnish stood out, but it's going above and beyond than your standard, standard lime or garnishes that we tend to use behind our bars here in the States. Uh, and then there's my tray afterwards. So you can't really quite tell, but uh, that was my, my uh, main tray. I got my glassware there, uh, four glasses plus an extra glass, uh, all my spirits. Uh, I use an ISI for, I uh, did a foam on stage, a passion fruit foam during my round. And then the garnishes are actually on the back right behind those bottles sitting in that same watch glass ready to go. So I'm literally just picking up the tray and bringing it to the stage and ready to go. Uh, before you go, before you get on stage, like we talked about earlier, you have that minute to talk about your inspiration, to talk about your cocktail. And this is how you're getting judged. Uh, ingredients, pairing structures, mixology profile. You know, was it average? Was it good? Was it excellent? So there's a range between 10, 20, 25. Uh, inspiration description, how well did you describe how you were inspired by this drink? You know, was it, you know, something that you shared with your grandmother and, and nothing against grandmothers. I love my grandmother. We all do. But I hopefully, once you start going to these, you see how many people use the, the, the grandmother line, like, oh, I'm inspired from my grandmother in times of this. And it reminds me of this. Try to be, do something different is all I can say. Uh, don't just talk about your grandmother. Don't just talk about the first time you had a cocktail, like 
really try to think outside the box. Um, and again, nothing against grandmothers. I, I love mine and I wish they were here now, but so many people tend to use that, that it's uh, just a little diluted when the judges hear it, I think, in my opinions, but up to you. Uh, name inspiration, what's the name of your cocktail and why you named it that way? Average, good, excellent. Uh, that's the content of your speech, not the attitude and your swagger when you're talking, your personality, quality, speech fluency, average, good, excellent, 10, 15, 20, uh, interactivity with the audience and speech and judges. Are you just sitting there nervous and just face down looking? Or are you looking at the judges? You're drawing them and you're bringing the crowd in. Uh, we get a five, 10 or 15 points on that. So let's get into uh, practice your speech as much as you can. You have a minute. That minute's going to go by like that. Practice in front of a mirror, practice in front of other people, and try to keep utilizing the same key points. So even if you miss, say, a word or two, your key points are there. Uh, and here's my speech, one of my speeches from this year's uh, past Pan American Games in the Dominican Republic. Statement representing the United States. You have a one minute to talk about your cocktail. Okay, Rob? Three, two, one, time. Hey, everybody, how you guys doing out there? My name's Rob Houston. Most of you guys know me for my passion of bartending. I love all style of bartending. Whether you're a flair bartender, whether you're a mixologist, why can't we just have fun and make drinks? That's what this is all about. For me, the first people to do this were the tiki bartenders, right? They had these extravagant recipes, seven, eight ingredients. They were flipping bottles, they were doing cinnamon fire, they were entertaining, making great cocktails. So my challenge to you is while we're here at this conference, just like this cocktail's name, let's break some boundaries. So there it was, I had a couple seconds left, about maybe 15 seconds left. Uh, some stuff I think I did really well there and some stuff I could have done better on. Um, ingredients, pairing structures, mixology profile. It was a tiki competition. I went a little into that, but I didn't go into, well, I used the lemons from uh, Lebanon as well as a vanilla from Madagascar to make this paired perfectly. Uh, it reminds me of a tiki cocktail I had. No, I kind of glossed over that, moved past that. Uh, that one category so I could score higher in all the other categories was the strategy I was going for that one. Um, whether it's right or wrong, however you do yours is up to you. There's no right or wrong way. Ideally, you want to score as high in every category as possible, but I purposely kind of left that part out so I'd score higher in the other categories. Uh, like inspiration and description, I felt like why why I was inspired by that cocktail. Uh, name inspiration, breaking boundaries and, and, and talking about and building it up to that. Uh, Attitude, personality, quality, speech. Like I just spoke from the heart and that I really felt that way. And, and I, I let it through through my words and looking at people and bringing them in and getting the crowd applause. And, and not only that, the judges get that. When It's easy when you get the crowd behind you, then the judges instinctively, whether they like you or not, want to get behind you because it's it's just like when you hear someone clapping, someone else wants to clap. Um, and then interacting with the audience and, and speech judges, same thing. So I felt like I scored very high in four of those categories. Uh, and not so high in the other category, but that's just the strategy I was going with. Whether it worked for you, just know that you are getting judged for that, and this is how you're getting judged. At least now you know, A, you're getting judged on it, and B, how I can score better in each one of those. Now it's time to compete. This is all the pre-stuff before you got to the physical bar. You are, garnish is done. All your ingredients on the bar. You did your one-minute cocktail, and now it's time to compete. Well, guess what? That's in part two. Hopefully you enjoyed this part one of IBA bartending techniques and how to properly prepare for IBA competitions. And hopefully you learned something and we look forward to seeing you on stage and then we'll see you as well in part two.